Hello, everyone. My name is Katie, and welcome to another edition of Data Center Insights from Intel. Before we dive into today's great webinar, I'd just like to point out a few features of the Bright Talk tool for you, our live audience. There is a questions tab at the top of your viewer. I do encourage you to please ask questions at any time. Um, our presenters will answer them at the end of the presentation. Also, at the end of today's webinar, you will be prompted to rate the presentation and feel free to take the time to provide feedback as we really value your thoughts and we will use this information to improve our webinars. If you don't get a chance to answer your question, or rather if we don't get a chance to answer your question, um, or if you have any suggestions for other webcasts you'd like to see, uh, please feel free to share them with us on Twitter at Intel IT Center. There's also an attachments tab where you can find supporting documents for today's presentation. Please feel free to download the presentation as well as visit links to some really great resources. These attachments will be available for you shortly after the webinar ends. So today's webinar episode is entitled Big Data Trends and Directions with Cisco. We have our fantastic presenters, Karthik Kulkarni. He is a Big Data Solutions Architect over at Cisco. And we also have Tim Abels, Systems Architect Principal Engineer here at Intel. So today, Karthik and Tim will be discussing the ever-changing landscape of big data, including recent big data trends and how big data technologies are playing a significant role in data analytics, and how Cisco and Intel help provide the solutions to unlocking your big data. It's truly wonderful to have you here with us today. And with that, I'm going to go ahead and hand things over to Karthik to start the presentation. Thanks. Hi, everyone. My name is Karthik. As, uh, I'm an architect for Big Data Solutions in Cisco UCSBU. Uh, uh, this is some of the legal notice and disclaimers. Today, I'll be talking about uh, big data trends specifically and what are some of the market drivers and uh, uh, what are some of the challenges that we are seeing in currently in the big data trends and what we are going to see in the next couple of years and some of the potential solutions for these. Uh, we'll also be talking about Cisco UCS Integrated Infrastructure for Big Data and, and Analytics. That's the Cisco UCS reference architecture for big data related uh, technologies. And also, some of the unique features as to what makes, what differentiates uh, Cisco UCS for, um, um, for some of the big data related solutions. Tim from, um, uh, will also be, from Intel will also be talking about some of the technology disruptions that we are seeing uh, from, a, uh, which would be, a, uh, which would make a difference in our big data solutions. Big data technologies has become ubiquitous in all the enterprise, major, all the major verticals, whether it is education, entertain, entertainment, agriculture, healthcare. If you look at it, it's, big data is really transforming the world. Consider, for instance, Amazon, Uber, Airbnb. Amazon uh, runs the largest online retail store uh, having no stores, or Uber manages the largest fleet of taxis with no cars, similarly with Airbnb with no real estate. So data is the new oil. So this is the new trend that uh, this has been going on and this has been catching up more and more. And not just that, if you look at uh, how IoT or the dig digital disruption is, is uh, underway, four main things are making a lot of difference. One is people, uh, devices, then you have mobile phones and processors. If you consider just people alone, by 2020, we'll have over 5 billion people connected to the internet, creating a lot of data, generating data through the devices they own as well, which will be over 50 billion devices. And by 2020, we are expected to have over 40% 40, 40 of network traffic generated by these devices. And mobile phone with the smartphones, we are, uh, going, we are expecting over 350 exabytes of data, which is being generated by 2020. So, all this data needs to be um, processed. You need to draw instant value out of it and um, also managed. So these are some of the things that are going to be challenges that we are going to face. And any data architect who's setting up um, their um, IT organization, setting up the uh, tools and technologies to, to manage this humongous amount of data is 
considering three aspects. Basically, you have the software largely driven by open source communities, open source um, initiatives, and you have the independent software vendors providing their distributions and their support. Then we have services and we have the infrastructure. In fact, infrastructure is over 50% of the cost of any of these big data solutions being implemented. That's largely because if you consider uh, some of these uh, deployments, we are not talking a couple of servers, we are talking about of hundreds of servers. In fact, it's quite common that we see with our own customers at uh, Cisco that most customers start off with just a few racks to understand how uh, they are able to unlock value of uh, the data they have. And within an year, there are over 100 servers. So we are talking about lots of servers, hundreds of servers, and mostly the performance is driven by how fast you are able to read and write data, how fast are you able to process data, whether it's compute, your processors, or even the analytical engine that you're running, uh, the software, and how fast are you able to move data. So all of these are going to be significantly going to impact the performance. Now coming to the big data trend, as I mentioned, we are going to have a lot of data which is going to be generated. Consider from, there could be many sources, your traditional web uh, uh, clickstream data, your log data, your web data sources, uh, all these uh, standard Hadoop uh, data sources. Then your IoT data, which is going to be, um, we are through this digital disruptions and the IoT is going to be more and more part of our life. So that's going to be generating a lot of data, which has to be, and you need to unlock value of it, of this data instantly to know the alerts, whether uh, the sentiment analytics, what's happening real time. Then the streaming data sources, the social media is generating, uh, again, a lot of data. And these could be even from devices or your standard um, Web 2.0 kind of technologies. Now, the data being coming from all these sources have to be stored. First, it has to be processed instantly to get your sentiment analytics, your real-time view, or, and your dashboard trying to say, hey, these are the alerts that we are getting. This is the failures, or these things are going fine. And you want to know, you want to process this data store this data and also manage this in the sense as the data gets old, how are you going to store these data? You don't need to store it. You need to have a tiered storage, a better data lifecycle management. So what has evolved is the Lambda architecture. If you look at it, this is uh, kind of the evolving architecture that we see in most of uh, the streaming data analytics. So you have a speed layer. Uh, to put it simply, Lambda architecture involves three major layers, speed layer. Speed layer is as the data is moving so far in Hadoop, we used to have just the batch layer, which is you store the data and you process the data through your MapReduce or your Spark, or you are just doing more batch analytics. You run the job for hours together, and then you get your data, uh, your value insights. Now, the speed layer is the new aspects, which is part of the Lambda architecture, where your data, as it's moving through the pipe or as it's data in transit, your uh, drawing value out of it. So you have what is called the complex event processing. I've just mentioned Kafka. There are multiple technologies there, similar technologies. It's the message bus. Uh, it's the message bus, which is storing data in transit. And this is being worked upon by the Spark streaming, which is processing the data in real time. And this can be uh, stored in uh, any of the analytical engines or your NoSQL databases to directly serve or it could be stored, again, for persistence and HDFS to do a lot more analysis. So this is the evolving architecture for some of the big data trends um, that we see. And to talk from a Cisco point of view, this, is, this, is, uh, this has a lot of moving parts. If you look at it, each of these, whether it's the edge, whether it's speed layer, batch layer, or serving layer, you have first from an infrastructure point of view, it's driven by different kind of uh, architectures, different processor, different network, and uh, IO bandwidth requirements. Then you also have different softwares running at different uh, uh, layers. So Cisco do, does have an end-to-end -end architecture. It works with all the major players in this uh, space. We've partnered with uh, most of the leading ISV partners, and we do have a, a large portfolio to cater to all the different layers and uh, of the Lambda architecture. And we have validated designs, which I'll be talking about in the next few slides. The next trend that we see is um, you have now data. You have your big data in your Hadoop systems, largely in your Hadoop systems. Then you have your enterprise data. 
now these two data are in separate silos but we need to we are seeing this trend that we need to marry this data between the big data and the enterprise data to have a larger context for your decisions so one such solution that we have is with sap hana and sap hana vora so sap hana vora is an analytical engine which sits on top of spark on hadoop which not just brings a lot of analytical uh, engine or analytical abilities like drill down analysis uh, for on hadoop itself but has this unique ability to run queries where you could not just query from hadoop but also can query from uh, sap hana so you are kind of bridging the divide between enterprise data and uh, big data to have a larger context for your decision making and this is a trend that we expect to see more and more more tighter integration between enterprise data and big data and uh, we are committed to working with all our uh, isp partners to have a yes, uh, more validated design so that it's easier for our customers to deploy and the third trend that i want to talk about is data life cycle management we are going to have lot of data which is being generated streaming analytic data that requires that you need to draw value instantly now there is also this data aging uh, aging of data where after a while that data need not be is not part of most of our queries so it need not be in the hottest or the 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 most premium servers so this data could be moved off to a cold server where uh, cold storage or archival where it's still relevant you can still run queries on it but it's not on your the, you can draw lower dollar per terabyte so you can have a more economical model of storing your data so hdfs has updates where you have you can have heterogeneous servers so that now you, the most premium data or the hottest data are stored on your best servers the best processor the fastest io and all the cold data could be transitioned or can be moved to your lower dollar per terabyte kind of storage so we do have a validated design on how to go about doing this data life cycle management so that you can keep growing your cluster to petabyte scale without uh, uh, hitting uh, ensuring that you still have a lower dollar uh, uh, better managed or better balanced dollar per terabyte storage management now shifting gears just to touch upon what is uh, cisco ucs uh, what cisco uh, ucs does in big data um, from a ucs point of view uh, itself we have over 52000 customers unique customers over 85% of fortune 500 uh, uh, deploys cisco ucs and we have 110 plus world records and uh, over 10 world records just in uh, big data um, i'll i'll be talking about it okay so <laughs> so from a ucs point of view our so, uh, storage or our architecture involves we have the uh, rack mount just a minute let me get back to the right slide we have the c uh, rack mount servers which are the core of our architecture which runs all our uh, big data architecture uh, solutions involves our intel xeon uh, processors they are dually connected uh, dual connect uh, uh, network connectivity of 10 gig and 40 gig to a fabric interconnect which is the switching module this module runs uh, sorry about the slides uh, looping um, this runs a software uh, module called the ucs manager ucs manager is a hi there Uh, it looks like we've run into a little bit of te technical difficulties with our slides. It looks like they're advancing here on their own. Um, so give us a minute here, folks, while we work on that. Sorry about that. Yeah. Um, perhaps uh, yeah. Tim and Karthik, you guys can continue on your topic sure. for a moment while I try and re-upload this. Sure. So the Cisco UCS. architecture involves the rack mount servers the c series servers which are um, 
which has uh, internal DAS, that is local storage, um, for uh, most of the big data applications. These have a dual connectivity to our switching module called the Fabric Interconnect, the dual 10 gig or 40 gig connectivity. And the switching module runs a software component called UCS Manager. The reason I'm, going, I'm talking about this is this software module, UCS Manager, is one of the key differentiators, especially for a big data deployment, because this is like the brain of the infrastructure and which provides centralized management. When we are talking big data uh, deployments, we are talking hundreds of servers. We have customers in thousands of servers too deployed. Now, you have a drive failure in one one node, or if you are trying to manage firmware update, or you are uh, you need to make sure that instead of going server by server, the simplest way of management is having a centralized management of the entire infrastructure. So. UCS server provides uh, UCS manager provides that ability, not just at a uh, server point of view, but from a network point of view also. So if you're looking at a, setting up a you know, rack of servers, you have storage, network, compute, three different aspects that has to be uh, configured, and the top of the rack. Now, just in storage, network, compute, or for compute BIOS, you need to have the BIOS settings, you need to have the firmware settings, your uh, storage RAID configurations, if any, the VLAN settings, and also a lot of top, uh, top of rack settings. All of this has to be done for every other server that you add. Now, this is quite a lot of work when you're doing hundreds of servers. Imagine you're scaling to thousands of servers or different, you're build, building a um, DR mirror um, data center. So with what UCS serve, a manager brings to the table is a concept called service profile template, service profiles, where the entire configuration is abstracted to the software, and we build policies. Hey, this is big data systems. This is the kind of network policy I need. This is the QoS policy I need. All of it is built into the service profile template, and this is blasted to the server as and when we add the server. So. From a single pane of glass, you can manage the entire infrastructure of hundreds of nodes deploying and provisioning the infrastructure even before the operating system is installed, giving an identity at a hardware level to the servers. So this has been one of the game changers, especially when you are considering data systems and you have DR, you have a... Um, you have a mirror data center, and you need to manage these data centers from, um, from a single pane of glass. You can still do that through our UCS Central or UCS Manager, where not just provisioning, but even monitoring of your cluster or growing your cluster can be done. So this is, this is called UCS uh, Service Profiles. And to extend this, now suppose you want to scale from your network point of view, because in a single domain, you can have around 40, 80 servers. But if you want to extend it to multiple domains or uh, UCS domains, you have to have an extended network architecture. Now, through Cisco ACI, like we have service profiles, we can scale to uh, the cluster to thousands of nodes with application profiles, just like you have for the server management service profiles for the network, we've simplified the whole network management and provisioning through a concept called application profiles. Now you can have a uh, now you can have hundreds of switches, all managed through a single pane of glass. You are no longer going to a switch. Uh, it's a spine leaf architecture, so you're no longer going to a leaf and saying, hey, this is the routing protocol, this is the port I need up, or so. You're managing the entire network and the infrastructure from a profile, application profile point of view, completely simplifying your deployment and provisioning and scaling. And to just continue with... Uh, uh, our slides are almost done, guys. Again, apologies for that. They no should problem. be right up here in just one moment. Yeah. And to talk about our UCS uh, integrated infrastructure for big data, uh, we work while we provide the infrastructure and the complete management and provisioning and automation. Uh, we can't do this alone. We work with all the major ISV vend uh, partners uh, from Hadoop, NoSQL, and Analytics. And one thing that is unique to us, which uh, we spend a lot of time, is when we work with our partners, we actually do a 
lot of we have our own uh, lab uh, with Cisco where we work with our partners to do the due diligence in the sense we go ahead implement the complete solution test it and validate it for performance and scalability and build what are called validated designs these are detailed documents which uh, go from anywhere from uh, 150 to 200 pages All right, I'll continue from here. So we work with our partners where we build uh, validated designs. And for those customers who want to, instead of going through the process of actually implementing these designs on their own, we do have a fully automated solution through UCS Direct for Express for big data, where we can, this is a validated, uh, where through a single click, they can deploy from end to end. Once they have racked it and stacked the servers, um, they, they can, point to a few servers and say, hey, these are the servers I want to have uh, this distribution of Hadoop deployed, and you can have point to another set of 20 servers and say, this is the distribution of Hadoop I want, and it's going to be deployed in a couple of minutes. And and I want to touch upon before I hand over to Tim, uh, sorry about the uh, slide uh, uh, transitioning. One of the value that I was talking about was uh, the simplified uni unified uh, central management. This is called the unified management from the Cisco UCS servers. The, so you can manage centrally hundreds and thousands of servers. Now, in fact, we had a study. Uh, the, um, IDC went ahead and did that study. The link below gives you the entire paper to study uh, seven of our large customers, what is the value that the centralized management brings? And according to their study, the break-even, the return on investment is around 366% in three years. This is largely, that is a break-even of five months. This is largely due to uh, lower cost of operations, over 32% lower cost of operations by having uh, a centralized management and also a faster deployment of servers because all the service, all the um, configurations are already in the service profiles. And when you add a server, you can just uh, blast that uh, service profile to the server, giving it an identity. Cisco, I would also like to add, uh, this is our validated design page where uh, Cisco dot go big data underscore design. We have the detailed validated designs uh, documented where we are not just solving um, uh, building build guides, but we are actually solving some of the complex big data trends and technology uh, problems, uh, the challenges that is being faced. One is we've implemented the Lambda architecture as in many different ways as how each of the different vendors, the ISV partners, look at it and try to cater to it, the Lambda architecture. Some of them have Kafka, some have, you have uh, different applications uh, trying to cater to the same Lambda architecture through different technologies. So we've gone and implemented that in detail. The second part is Cisco and Intel has a joint um, POC lab where not only do we test a lot of, uh, we, where we do have a lot of engineering, um, joint engineering validation and uh, development, we do have this lab that we, uh, we uh, can have customers try out, run their POCs for a week or two, and we provide them remote access uh, and a fully supported environment where they can really try out um, the big data, um, their specific uh, POCs in our lab. Going forward, I'll hand over the, um, the mic to Tim. Okay. Thanks. Uh, let me click forward here. And should be should be moving forward. Um, click forward again. Uh, click it one more time. Okay. Um, 
for some uh, reason, there it is. Okay, I've went, okay, let me go back a little bit. Um, I'm going to go back. Um, so sorry, guys. I, it seems we are having a technical glitch with the tool here as opposed to the slides having some issues. Um, I Just a quick reminder that when Tim and Karthik are finished with this presentation, we will have the deck in the uh, attachment section for you to look at and so that you can see these slides. Um, our sincere apologies uh, to both the presenters and the audience right now. Okay. Thanks. Um, and just to give some context here, uh, what you've just heard so far is a complete solution stack for big data. You know, management, networking, platform, storage. This is from one vendor, not, not four or five, one vendor. And it's all validated. And it's not just validated for the stack, it's validated end to end. It's validated with third party, with all of the quality leaders in big data. So that's what you just saw. And when I say validated, uh, you heard the website, cisco.com, slash go, slash big data. Again, slash go, slash big data. And from there, you can have the validation lab, one stop to get all of this. There's a second lab called POC. So if you want to look at something forward-looking and you'd like to evaluate something in a week or two, that's also an interesting lab. And so we'll describe some disruptive technologies that help both of those labs. And you got to see today that it's live. It really is live. <laughs> so uh, as far as the um, IoT, we want to point out that a lot of what's driving big data is the massive growth of devices, sensors, and connecting them to the Internet. Previously, even today, only about 15% of embedded devices are connected to Internet. So you can imagine the wave of data that's coming and all the value from that data. In addition to the size, this is all due to Moore's Law. That's why now. The density, the lower power, the lower cost, and very custom sensors. And so now you're talking 40X and 60X, as this shows, much lower cost of bandwidth and processing. That's why you're hearing about this as a unified solution, unified computing systems because it's much lower cost, and that's really the two disruptive things from these two companies. Now, one example is automotive. So if you think of autonomous driving, here is an example of just the sensors for wireless that are in a car with eight different frequency ranges and you know distance, uh, gigahertz, and on the right column there are all of the ADAS usages. So to be able to do lane keeping, parking, uh, urgent you know, stopping. How do you identify obstacles? How far ahead can you identify them? So we've made six acquisitions in this space to be able to detect things a few meters earlier, to be able to uh, have cognitive and even machine learning, a very large, to put into these validated solutions you, you've heard about. So. Uh, to give you a size of the data, think of it as a test vehicle to create the data center data to crunch on is about 10 terabytes an hour. One airplane flight is 40 terabytes per flight. So there's a lot of very valuable big data coming. And if you think of that per factory, you know, per building, per retail, a lot of big data. And just like this driverless example, data is steering the car. Data is steering all of the 5G aircrafts. You know, a human can't make a billion decisions a second. And in a car, a human can't make thousands of decisions a second. So 90% of accidents are caused by humans and preventable and a great opportunity as we automate more and more with big data. So here's a view of big data in the data center. And so think of big data in two forms. One is the uh, holistic in the data center, massively parallel software that creates a lot of the knowledge. And then a subset of that runs in the car, 13 volt battery, and has the rules to execute to have a complete high def map to drive that car. 
So there's the real time in the car, and there's the uh, highly parallel, high bandwidth in the data center. And so here's an example of a flow that test vehicles create all the data, it gets crunched in the data center, and it gets compressed to run very efficiently in the car itself. So the stack you've heard about and the unified view you've heard about, one way is to think of the building blocks underneath it. So what does Intel do to provide a unified uh, pieces parts that can be unified by Cisco? So we have three reference solutions. The first column is our IoT reference solution. And notice how I emphasize the rows for big data and analytics, which is today's topic. So let's first look at the entire column for IoT. This would be when you need real time. Very low latent. The car itself is effectively a fog. And if you're familiar with open fog, the major standard in this space, uh, Intel and Dell are the chairmen of the, the standard, the working groups, the, you know, a huge influence there to make sure this is done very secure, functionally safe, real time, that the entire network, the entire stack can guarantee quality of service. So that's the idea of a fog here is to have these kind of real time abilities. And so that's the emphasis here. So even the file systems like Spark and such and the OSs, everything is about uh, you know, near real time. And notice the options in a fog here and the options in IoT to be able to have extreme temperatures, 10 year life plans, vertical certification so you know this is approved by automotive safety and such. Same thing with factory, home, building, et cetera. Now for us, IoT is in three phases. The first phase is connected. As I said earlier, 85% of embedded is still not connected to the internet. It's not the IoT without the I. And then smart, how do we take these and actually connect them to a gateway? It effectively brings all these things to the cloud, to the internet. And then finally, autonomous and fog. How do we bring the compute and the analytics to the things? So these are some big phases and transitions that we see in IoT that are heavily going to need unified, networking, validated, and the things you've heard from today's seminar. The second column here is scalable systems. And here, unlike low latency that you would get from hardware and low latency that you would get from and low power from, say, an FPGA in this first column, this is massively parallel. You know, you won't see huge clusters and GPUs in a car. You will see FPGAs and hardware power, low power, and low latency. But this is great for offline. So to go create all the number crunching in the one data center that feeds the millions of cars. And so here, it's the 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 file systems are parallel, batch mode, very scalable, and think of this as more offline. So for learning and deep neural nets, deep learning, this is the, the right solution. And so here are some well-known standards, well-known software in this space. And Intel has some customized versions of these out on GitHub. So go to your favorite open source collaboration and look at these and improve on them and you'll see 2x, 50x performance improvement because it's tuned for very scalable, specific hardware. And when I say specific hardware, of course, we're future compatible, backward compatible, across Xeon, across Phi, one instruction set. But to tune it to that is a huge improvement in these major algorithms. And then the fabrics to make sure that, you know, non-blocking, silicon photonics, we'll describe some of these. And that's the kind of thing you would work out in the POC lab. Uh, as far as leadership in the top 500, the top, the green 500, leaderships in performance per node, performance per watt, which one do you want to tune for? Again, go to the validation lab for immediate products. Go to the POC lab uh, for more forward-looking, and you'll be able to quickly crank out uh, your solutions with the confidence of knowing this is exactly what's used in the largest solutions the largest banks, the largest enterprise, but for big data and analytics you're hearing about today. This third column is rack scale design. Think of this as hetero, pieces, parts. And so you'll hear about all these ingredients in some later slides. This is effectively my outline of any future slides is 
the IoT framework, the HPC framework, and then the hetero framework. And at the bottom, these are some common technologies, and some of them more forward-looking that we'll describe also. That's another benefit of the validation lab is it's not just this generation, but to know that, you know, what's coming, the major disruptions, and we'll introduce some of those things also. So here is the IoT platform. Again, we're starting with that first column we just showed you, and it's things connected by network to the cloud. So that was the first phase. Once you add a gateway, you've effectively brought all these things to the cloud. So even things that were not previously connected, they only need to talk a very constrained protocol, a constrained uh, I.O. And, and compute to talk to the gateway. And then once that's done, uh, you can have very custom, very low cost, low power uh, things. You can also bring the fog to the things in another generation and have compute and analytics all the way at the edge in real time and much more secure on premise. So there's other options there too. So part of IoT is FPGAs from Altera, RealSense and video uh, and vision, computer vision. Very small OSs, 8 kilobyte OSs, and 32 kilobyte, the major Linux OSs globally supported. Analytics, uh, McAfee security, uh, all, you know, cloud-based developer tools. These are some of the suite of things available that are all building blocks for, you know, eventually for unified computing systems. So the second column was the scalable systems framework. Here you'll see uh, a lot of uh, fabric and a lot of parallel software. And so, you know, you notice here three teraflops per socket. You know, so performance per node. Uh, if you also want performance per network, performance per watt, there's a lot of reconfiguration that's possible when you get into a validation lab. So what is the perfect fit for your workload and to be able to test everything in one validation lab? Where else can you go to get complete management, networking, platform, and storage, test your entire workload? Uh, we heavily use DPDK to give us low bandwidth, and the main test suite we use for that is Cisco's T-Rex, which lets any layer 4 through 7 get tested in this environment. So between those two things, you can really test all connectivity of your solution. So example of performance improvement would be for things like machine learning. So if you notice here, this stack is customer choice, all open, and all the frameworks we're showing are open standard with customer choice. And so you can go to intel.com slash machine learning, one stop for all algorithms, and that can take you to GitHub for the open source collaboration and add your value to math kernel, tune it with VTune, uh, OpenCL, all the major algorithms in machine learning are there. As an example of performance improvement, we can solve your biggest problems with uh, massively improvements over, say, traditional graphics, and to be able to know that you're using one common instruction set. Backward compatible, future compatible, cross compatible. So very easy story for developers to get their first taste of deep learning, machine learning, and uh, a big improvement and you can get much more detail. We have a complete IDF on this that you can, you can go find pretty easily. So that's the middle column. The right column is rack scale design. Notice all the ingredients here. Imagine how hard it would be to test and verify each one as opposed to going to one validation, one unified, one management system, one console. You hear the word one a lot. And that's what you heard in the first half. And to be able to know that all these options for compute, one instruction set. All these options for storage. Again, you know, the simplicity of, of uh, validation. I mentioned the DPDK. Your bandwidth can be 2 to 50 times faster. To appreciate that, replace 50 gateways with one. In the case of RFID and small nodes. Replace many CPUs with one FPGA replace multiple FPGAs with one accelerator. These are the kind of things that you can find out in a lab to guarantee your workload is completely fitting to this. 
So these are some core building blocks. And as far as a simple example, if you went in and you wanted to move the current generation of the processor, replace two with one, moving from a hard drive to SSD, replace five with one, moving to 10 gig, replace two with one, and here's examples of that. The combination, replace 20 with one. So if you're doing big data on the major file system, which is Hadoop, this exact example is Hadoop, and in fact, it even works for enterprise. And so we've taken the Lustre file system, have an enterprise edition for that, and taken uh, Hadoop examples, apps running on that. So again, very friendly file system. These are the dominant file systems used in big data and in parallel and now working together. So those are the examples of why you want to go into lab. My last three slides speak to future technologies that you can go to the POC lab. So we have a joint POC lab with Cisco, and not only can you validate and verify with everything uh, from unified computing systems, again, it's uh, cisco.com slash go slash big data, but you can also look too forward and know that you've got a lot of built-in future proof. In this example, memory is a thousand times faster than NAND, 1,000 times faster, lower latency. To appreciate that, there's only been eight major kinds of memory ever created, DRAM, NAND, SRAM, and in this case, 3D Crosspoint. So to know that everything you're building is not only validated, but has built-in future proof and an eye toward long life, long term. And in the case of IoT, we target 10, 15 year for many of our embedded and IoT applications. This is also 10x more dense. That's why you can start talking of terabytes per socket. So a lot more memory, a lot more storage than previous. Another major is FPGA. So for things like Altera, what is the right fit for Altera? Is it extreme embedded, very low, low power? Is it scaling with the biggest Xeons? How do you replace many CPUs with one FPGA? How do you maximize on-premise, like in a car, where you can't do massively parallel software or GPUs? You can only do very low power, get the hardware, of, you know, the power of hardware, uh, and think about it. You know, if you're not using that part of hardware, there is no power penalty at all. Just a few algorithms, a few parts of hardware you need to use, you know, very uh, beneficial. And also the low latency of hardware. You know, you want your brakes, your airbags, all your mission critical systems to be hardware latency and not the seconds of delay or, or something of software. So this is the FPGA for discrete. If you want it integrated and make it work with Xeon, with FPGA, uh, again, you know, common instruction sets, common usages, and unified validation. The last slide is silicon photonics, and the idea of 300 meters is one computer. To have the speed of light, the photonics combined with silicon right on the CPU. So these are the kind of things that you're not just hearing, you know, how you can be validated today, but you're also getting the entire stack, third-party, end-to-end lifecycle, and future-proof. Thank you. Karthik? All right. Hey, guys. Great job. Um, again, apologies for the little glitch there, but let's get to um, some great questions that came in from our audience. Uh, let's see. What are some examples of your biggest data and analytics solutions, and how did you keep them scalable and simple? Um, and this is Karthik. So from uh, Cisco UCS, we have um, uh, customers uh, deploying big data, thousands of customers deploying uh, big data in almost all the major vertic verticals. And uh, one of the main unique features that I already mentioned uh, from a scalable point of view is our unified management. This brings a centralized management which is key to any sim simplified management. If you're looking at it when you're having hundreds of servers, 
um, or even thousands of servers, the simplest way to manage it, all of them, is having a central management, uh, a single pane of glass. And uh, this is not just this also not just are we monitoring and managing here. We can even grow the cluster as I mentioned, with fully automation. So this is kind of key to a, a scalable and simple solution. Great, thanks, Karthik. Let's see here. We got another question. Uh, what are the safe steps to evaluate or pilot Cisco Unified Computing System, and where can I find more info? Great. Uh, this is Tim. And so a good start is the joint POC lab that we have with Cisco. Uh, customers can run their POCs there for a week or two for free to evaluate the system. And uh, they can remote access into it to try out things. It's a very smooth, easy on-ramp. And these are the best practices for scaling. And again, you still get big insights into future-proof, massive scaling, with the best third party. So that's a, a good place to start. Also the link you see on the screen here, you know, that's a place to start for all the white papers, solution briefs, and such. So there's a validated lab, there's a POC lab. Highly recommend uh, going to these links and these contacts. Great, Tim. And it looks like we have one last question. Uh, how are Cisco Unified Systems on Intel unique? Yeah. So our uh, entire uh, big data solution with Cisco UCS is, is on Intel Xeon processors. I didn't mention that. So some of the unique things uh, that we bring to the table is we, uh, we have uh, linear scalability, especially with uh, uh, Cisco ACI where you can scale your architecture to thousands of nodes having centralized management. And um, one thing we do spend a lot of efforts is in our, uh, I didn't mention about the validated design, where we spend not just weeks, we spend uh, one or two months to come up with the best configuration, best um, settings, uh, not from the infrastructure point of view, from application point of view, from platform or OS point of view, to tune the systems for scaling and performance. And um, if, um, so that's all published. So we do spend uh, effort so that customers don't have the risk of deploying something which is not validated. So uh, that's one thing that we spend efforts on. And um, the main unique solution is the centralized management, the unified management that Cisco brings to the table, not just from server's point of view, but the entire infrastructure, network compute storage. And, uh, and the application with our automation as well. So that makes uh, so, uh, the solution almost uh, the easiest to deploy and easiest to manage. Great. Well, uh, Tim, did you have any, sorry, were you gonna add something there? You good? Okay. Well, uh, guys, those are the only questions we had come in during this presentation. So I want to thank Karthik and Tim so much for this incredibly informative and really outstanding presentation. Uh, we really thank you for taking the time to be here with us as well as the audience. Um, we hope that you join us for future episodes of Data Center Insights. And if you haven't subscribed to our channel already, you can do so from the main Data Insights uh, Data Center Insights channel window. And this way you can stay up to date uh, with all of our upcoming webinars and easily register. So uh, until next time, be well and have a great day, everyone. Take care. Thanks. Thanks Bye. a lot.